Well, hello everyone and welcome to Leadership Foundation's Town Hall meeting where we aim to convene thought leaders and practitioners who will inspire us to kind of continue with creating change for a better world. Uh, my name is Cornelius Williams and I'm the president of the Resurgence Leadership Foundation here in Atlanta and I'm a co-host with uh, my friend, mentor, um, Dave Hillis, who's the president of the Global Le Leadership Foundation Network. And so before we get going today, uh, I'd like to uh, pray. I'm going to read my prayer today. Um, yeah, let's pray. Lord, uh, we are grateful for access to you that came as a result of great sacrifice on your part. I'm reminded of your prayer in John 17 um, this day. I know that you not only prayed for those who were with you at the time, but for all of us that have believed in you as a result of their witness. Your goal for us is to be one, one heart and mind, just as you and the Father are one. You understood that our unity would help the world to believe in you and know that your love for us is the same way the Father loved you. I ask that you would bless our time together today to help with fulfilling your mission to see unity spread across this world. Um, we're grateful um, and we commit this time to you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, you all, we, um, as, you know, I, I, you know, it's funny. I say this every week, but it really is because every week has its own personal flavor. And uh, but we do have an exciting time today. We'll get to hear from a new friend of mine, Peter Weiner, um, and I'll introduce him a little bit more. And from the Lexington Leadership Foundation team, Eric, David, and Marcus. But before we get into our agenda today, where we'll hear from Dave, Peter, and the Lexington team. I'm going to turn it over to Jonathan for some housekeeping. Jonathan? Thank you, Corn. Uh, as a go to of our default, all attendees are muted. This is to ensure sound control and a quality recording. But we do want to hear from you, so please utilize the question window found in the GoToWebinar control panel to enter any questions that you might have, and we'll do our best to address them uh, during the webinar. If you want to be unmuted so that you might share loud, uh, please use the raise your hand function also found in the GoToWebinar control panel. Uh, and this will alert us that you'd like to be unmuted. Thank you so much for joining. And thank you, Jonathan. Thank you. For those of you that may be joining us for the first time, one of the things that um, we've done with our town hall over the past several months is we pause to kind of look at the value that inform our practices. They kind of inform um, our way of proceeding. Dave, that's, I learned that word from you. Um, <laughs> or, you, know, you know. And so uh, uh, today we want to look at the value. It, it, you know, it says relationships that bridge, and it's it's this idea of uh, where the incarnation creates reconciliation. And so uh, this one, I'm actually kind of curious, even though it's uh, the incarnation is something that I've been around. Dave, you, I know you've talked several times with us about the pandemic and how it's kind of unearthed both this virus through COVID-19, but you've also mentioned this idea of this injustice and racial inequity that also has surfaced. And so um, I'm kind of curious as we look at the value of relationship to Briz, um, um, and how did you come up with uh, the formation of this value. Yeah, Cornelius, um, one of the things I would just say is that uh, any of these values uh, that we're talking about, um, it would be important to note that I didn't come up with them as much as I uh, looked into Sam Shoemaker and Reed Carpenter's life and just simply said, what were they about? What was that original charism of seeing the city as playground um, versus battleground um, really about. And it was pulling out of them in, in many ways, uh, these, these 10 values. So this one, um, relationships of bridge, one of the things that was remarkable about Sam and Reed back in the early 60s in the midst of hyper-denominationalism, right? When, when nobody was talking with each other, um, both of them, uh, you know, built 
bridges uh, to others. Mm -hmm. uh, Sam, in particular, an Episcopalian priest, but uh, he, uh, you know, was friends with Pentecostals, with Catholics, high church, low church. Uh, I think I mentioned this before. He was one of the people, along with a Jesuit, a guy by the name of Father Dowling, that actually wrote the theology to the 12 steps of the AA movement. That's right. That's right. So, <clears throat> Baked into LF from the very beginning was this notion uh, that you have to have relationships uh, that, that bridge to other people. Mm -hmm. uh, we're all on the same team. You know, we're all you, you know, wearing the same uniform. Uh, so let's let's try to make that real. Let's try to make John 17 something that that actually can be operationalized in a particular city. You know, there's a particular text though that I would say that gave, at least for me, a little bit more of a sense of what does relationships that bridge look like. Yeah. And it's, uh, it's in Acts 13, uh, 1 through 3. And the interesting thing about this is it's one of those places in the scripture where initially all you see is names. Um, but, you know, being, a, being an English and history major, I was curious that in the, uh, the third verse it says, that the Holy Spirit uh, came down and spoke to this group um, to, you know, uh, go a particular way. And I said, well, we all want that, right? What, mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. wouldn't it be great if the Holy Spirit spoke to us? But does them going out and speaking have something to do with who the group was? And here's, mm -hmm. here's what Acts 13 1 says. It says that there was a, a group of people gathered together uh, and he, they list five names. Uh, so there's Barnabas, who, if you remember right, he was the uh, great bridge for the Apostle Paul. He was a Levite. Uh, he was a Cyprian. Uh, then the next name is Simon of Niger. Um, and our, our best sense of that is that he was probably Northern African. Uh, Niger means black. So here is a, a black man. Um, that is a part of this first team that would have very little to do with Barnabas, a Levite, and a Cyprian. Uh, the next person we have is Lucius of Cyrene. Uh, Lucius uh, is also probably Northern African uh, and Berber, so um, uh, a, a different uh, kind of person. Again, very different than Barnabas, to be sure. Um, then we have Saul, who, of course, is going to become. Paul, uh, but he's not even yet, you know, the famous St. Paul that we know. Uh, he is the, you know, Hebrew of Hebrews in many ways. Mm. And all four of them are absolutely and radically different than one another. If they had one thing in common, it was probably going to be their antipathy and hatred for the fifth member, which was Menaean, out of the house mm. of, Her of Herod the Tetrarch. So here's this group gathered together. Um, it's, it is so uh, unbelievable that they actually have to invent a name <clears throat> to describe the behavior that they're watching in Acts 13. And it's, it, it's the word Christian. So you remember in the text, it says is that it was for the first time this group of people in Antioch were called Christians. And, and, you know, and I, I, dig, I digress a little bit, but what I would want to lift up is that the very nature, the, the, the very essence of what it means to be Christian is to build bridges to others. Um, it's not something that we do as an activity. It's, it's literally what it means to be Christian is you, you, you build bridges. And so one of the things, again, I would just say to the LF Network is that uh, our business uh, in cities, uh, in the midst of the wheel of change, uh, engaging leaders of good faith and goodwill, building the capacity of others, uh, developing joint initiatives. What sits at the very base of that is always uh, this notion, uh, this idea, but how do we build bridges to others uh, that are probably different than us, uh, you know, probably disagree with us at, at some mm. fundamental level? But it's, it's going to be that relational bridge, which will make our cities more like playgrounds than battlegrounds. Hmm. Man, man, wow. Um, okay, Dave, you know, so it's interesting. I'll say this. 
you challenged me several weeks ago to kind of look at some theology around some of the things I've been thinking about. And one of the things I did bump back into was this leadership team and how the juxtapose this, this church versus the um, church in Jerusalem. And they didn't get called the Christian in the church in Jerusalem, to your point, because it didn't reflect what Jesus said in um, Acts 1. Uh, but Dave, okay, so here's, I'm, I'm kind of curious though, and I'm gonna pick your brain is, okay, so man, people have been Christian. Okay, this is not new, but um, you don't see a lot of this happening, even under the umbrella of those who profess to be Christian. And so how do we as presidents and um, kind of uh, individuals in this network help get the people that are quote, quote, on our team to buy into this. Well, as is always the case, you, you ask a question that if I had the answer, I would have uh, written a book about it and tried to make some money. Come on, uh, Dave, you're my, you're my leader, man. Come on, buddy. I will say this is a wonderful advertisement in some ways for our guest uh, this morning. Uh, Pete has written a lot about, you know, what does it mean to get into that public uh, space and, and build relationships. Um, you know, I, I think at, at, a, at a very practical level, um, you know, for me at least, Cornelius, part of the way it works is that I want to uh, learn uh, what it means um, to, you know, love a city in such a way that uh, it's going to take all different types. So in my early years with uh, running the Northwest Leadership Foundation, uh, one of the quote unquote disciplines I had was that on a monthly basis, I would make my way <clears throat> over to a different uh, house of worship. Um, and I would, uh, again, sit, you know, in that house of worship, uh, whether it was Pentecostal, whether it was Catholic, uh, you know, whether it was mainline, uh, you know, Protestant, uh, you know, introduce myself to the pastor, uh, thank the pastor uh, for, you know, saying yes to serving this city. Uh, and, and as best as I can, you know, try to enter in uh, to their to their story. Um, so that was just on a very practical level. I mean, just, you know, again, building a bridge, um, you know, it, it was it was amazing, you know, how rich that time became over the years. Um, I mean, I think probably 10 years into my my career, I mean, I probably knew more pastors uh, in the city of Tacoma than anybody. Um, and it was for no other reason other than I just made my way over to their to their particular house. So so that was one. The second thing I did on a very practical level um, is make use of what we oftentimes in LF describe as setting the table. Um, so, uh, you know, Teresa and I would try to, as best as we could, um, have different people in the city over for a meal. Um, and, you know, again, it, it might just seem so simple, but uh, it's the rare person that is going to uh, say no to a meal, a good bottle of wine, uh, and a conversation where you just begin to get to, to know each other. Um, and then the third thing that would happen, um, and, and this would be what I would describe as maybe a, a little bit more graduate, particularly when you were bringing people together that you knew um, had a, a kind of, you know, maybe issues with one another. But we would try to have conversations around um, the idea about, you know, given your particular position, um, what is it in your position that most troubles you? Uh, so what, whatever the issue is, what, you know, I mean, you're, you're committed to it, you're doing great things with it, but is there a part of your argument or your position that troubles you? And the second question is, is what is it about your opponent's position that you most appreciate? And those two questions, um, you know, again, you have to do it at the right time in the right way. But if you're able to articulate them, uh, it's it's incredible what I think begins to open up with regard to people having conversation with one another. And I, I suspect when we watch Jesus walk through the, the Gospels, 
that's what's at play in uh, him setting the table, right? Him uh, constantly uh, being at table with people where they have these kinds of conversations. And ultimately, I think the best way you can describe it is it's, it's relationships that bridge. Mm. Man, okay. Uh, you know, this is, this is so unfortunate. I remember Debbie said, Corn, you I appreciate that you're curious. I do have a myriad of questions that just popped in my head. Um, but the idea of being challenged to go to different houses, to set the table and buy people over for a meal and the idea of um, having an intentional conversation. It's funny, the question I listened to this morning on NPR is what is keeping you up at night? You know, which is similar to, you know, what is most, you know, so. Well, Dave, um, hopefully, again, we as presidents will um, try to live that out um, so that we can, and again, like you said, operationalize John 17, um, which, uh, which is really good because it brings us to our, our guest today. Um, everyone, uh, today we get the chance to have as our thought leader, um, uh, Peter Weiner. Uh, he's the vice president and senior fellow at the Ethics and Public Policy Center, a, con a contributing opinion writer for the New York Times and editor for the Atlanta Magazine. He's, he served in the Reagan and George Bush administrations prior to becoming deputy director of speech writing for uh, President George Bush. And uh, Peter, are you with us? I am. Thanks for having me on. It's a uh, thrill to be with you. Uh, this, again, I think in really trying to honor and operation with John 17 and even to uh, the town hall has become one of those places where we really do try to invite people in and have conversations. So we're glad you're with us um, today. And so I'll turn it over to Dave. He's got a question for you and then uh, we'll go from there. Yeah, Pete, again, thank you on behalf of Leadership Foundations. And as I mentioned to you before our town hall started, I've been a, a real fan of your writing. Uh, you have been, a, again, a remarkably courageous and articulate uh, soul that, uh, that has at least helped me uh, navigate these times that we're, uh, we're living in. So, Pete, right at the very beginning, one of the, one of the sort of ideas that sits uh, in LF um, is this notion that faith, at least initially, uh, is seeing things for the way they are, not the way that they should be. Um, and that's, as I, sh I should add here real quickly, that it's it's remarkable to watch Jesus again walk through the Gospels and that that first move of his is, is you know, what is going on right now before he tries to move people to what could be from your perspective, um, given what we're kind of living through right now, I mean, what what is going on and has there ever been uh, something, you know, in our past that is anything quite like our current situation? Pete, are you there? Uh, I'm you. Oh, there. Let's see. Can you hear me now? Yeah, we can. Okay. okay. Yeah, the conversation earlier was was terrific, and I took took notes, um, especially about this idea about entering other people's stories, which which I want to come back to. But in terms of, um, are there antecedents for for this time? I mean, I would disaggregate, I guess, a little bit. There's there's the uh, time that the country's going through, and then also the Christian faith, and of course, Christian faith has a lot of different. Uh, elements within it. Our country right now um, is deeply polarized. There's a lot of political antipathy that, that characterizes this, um, this moment. It's not unprecedented. Um, the founding of the Republic was a deeply divisive time, right? So if you go back to the election of 1800 between Adams and Jefferson, um, scholars said that the young Republic was almost torn apart. You know, you have the Civil War where we were literally uh, torn apart. Um, it was just an unbelievably brutal thing. You had the late 60s, 68, and uh, was was an awful year of, of divisions. Um, but we are in a period now which which I think is 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 not a good one. Um, people are um, divided. Are more than any time in in my political lifetime, we're in a situation in which. Um, when you have disagreements with people, it's not simply that you think that they're wrong, you think that they're evil, that they're malevolent. And we know from polling information that there is this kind of ad hominem attitude toward those who have views that are different than, than ours. I think it's a complicated set of reasons of why that's happening. Um, 
part of it is fear. I think there's a tremendous amount of fear on mm -hmm. on both sides, including within and sometimes especially within Christians. And mm -hmm. fear of general matter uh, is is not a good emotion. It catalyzes a lot of other very dangerous things, um, including ultimately hate um, for, for for the other. And as as both you Cornelius and David know better than I, fear not is one of the most frequent admonitions within within Christianity. I'd say for the country, the reasons for polarization, just very quickly, the purification of the political parties, which has been going on for decades now, um, the, you used to have moderate you know, conservative Democrats and liberal Republicans, and for a complicated set of reasons, that is no longer the case. So both parties themselves have very few bridge figures. There's something that analysts call the big sort, that we are as, as, as Americans sorting ourselves geographically by faith, by lifestyle. So we're not having any interaction with other people. It's always so much easier to dehumanize people you don't actually know. We live in the age of a social media and social media I think is toxic for this kind of, kind of thing. Um, there's a feeling that people have of, of, of being threatened. Amy Chua wrote a, a very good book called Political Tribes. Um, and then there's a kind of loneliness epidemic that, that I think characterized the country. Um, and uh, so people have invested importance in politics way beyond what, 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 it, what it should be. So we're in, a tough, we're in a tough place right now. Go ahead, Dave. Go ahead, Okay, hey, okay hey, Peter, as you um, kind of describe kind of the landscape, you know, one of the things, again, as I look at our role as people of faith, as Christians, um, you know, what do you believe um, the Christian perspective has to offer um, what's going on out there right now? Yeah, it's, it's, it's such a good, that's such a good, good question. Um, I'd say several um several things um one is the the, the um, a kind of what i would refer to as a christian anthropology but what i mean by that is it's a notion that each of us has uh, inestimable worth and inherent human dignity and i just think that that gets lost i think as you get involved in debates whether theological debates or political debates um, you begin to lose sight of the fact that people are due certain things, um, a certain degree of respect and honor, regardless of what the position that they that they hold. So I think that's important. Um, I think the other things that that uh, Christian should uh, model and Christianity has to offer is is grace uh, that we should be able to model grace. Um, it was interesting. One of my favorite books is by a friend of mine, Philip Yancey, who wrote a book called What's So Amazing About Grace. He wrote this in the 1990s. And near the beginning of the book, he said when he uh, was doing it, he would go through and ask people in the airport, strangers, when he mentioned Christians or evangelical Christians, what were the first things that came to their mind? And he said he heard a lot about culture war issues. He never once heard the mm. grace. And look, if you believe, as, as we do, that right at the dead center of Christianity is grace. And if that's not what the world is seeing, if it's not what they're receiving, that is a, a, a real problem. Um, I think Dave hmm. used grace, which I thought was lovely. And I think it's really rooted in, in the whole arc of, 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 of the Christian story, which is to enter into other people's stories. Hmm. Um, that is to, to learn their experience. And it's not simply to do because you want to um, learn their stories or because it's, it's, it's a way of showing respect to them. I think what we have lost as Christians, and I know I battle this in my own life and in my political life, is it's the notion of um, why do you want to do that? And I think part of the reason is um, a kind of epistemological modesty um, you know, a, a very important figure in my life, uh, Steve Hayner, told me, I saw him shortly before he died, and he said, I believe in objective truth, but I hold lightly to our ability to perceive truth. And what he meant by that, <laughs> all of us have, even if you, if you have a right angle, let's say in some metaphysical sense of what the truth of, of a particular position is, none of us 
uh, can fully know what the truth is. All of us are products of our families of origin, our, our experiences, the culture in which we live in. And we need to widen the aperture of our understanding. And that involves getting people from different spheres of life with different life stories to yeah. try to tell us. And so, and so we begin to learn better. Um, C.S. Lewis and Owen Barfield um, had a wonderful relationship. They're part of the Inklings. And in Surprised by Joy, Lewis tells us, uh, has this description. It's a lovely description. It's about halfway through where he talks about first friends and second friends. Arthur Greaves was his first friend. That's the person who's your alter ego. You begin the sentence. That person can, can complete it. You stand sort of as in Lewis's word, shoulder to shoulder, seeing the world the same way. Barfield was what he called second friend. He said, that's not your alter ego. That's your anti-self. That's the person where if you read the same books, uh, the other person draws all the wrong conclusions from 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 the book. <laughs> but they had a lovely relationship. It was it, it may have been one of the it was certainly one of the most important of Lewis's life. And Lewis describes how he and Barfield would have these debates, uh, public and and personal. And he said they would go at it hammer and tong late into the night, and how this sort of mutual antipathy would begin to dissolve, and you would begin to enter into the world of the other, and. Um, Barfield said later that, that Lewis and I, uh, when we debated, we always debated for truth, not for victory. And I thought that's such a mm. wonderful way to think wow. about it. Wow, excellent. So those are, those are some, there's a, there's a lot more modeling and we debate well, but, but yeah. those are some, what I think. Wow. You know, Pete, hey, Pete um, that's good, bro. Good, good. Go ahead, Dave. That's good. Yeah, Pete, as I was listening to you, I, you know, the one of the things we've talked a lot about in the foundations is that when, particularly in the book of John, uh, Jesus is first described, um, he's described as here is one who is full of grace and truth. And of course, with John, uh, word, word and word order is important. And the notion is that it wasn't truth and then grace, um, because we have an inability, I think, to grab a hold of truth apart from grace. So in other words, grace needs to precede truth. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think what you articulated is, is exactly that. Given that, though, Pete, I, I would be curious then to have you reflect a bit more on, you know, this wonderful theology of grace. Why is it that it mm -hmm. seems to be so absent um, within the religious discourse? And maybe particularly um, as it relates to what it seems like is the evangelical discourse with regard to that. Yeah, I, I'd say several things. Um, I guess on the on the deepest level, I would say that we ourselves um, haven't felt touched by grace. I think it's very hard to uh, give grace to others when you haven't felt grace yourself. Mm. Um, and I think when you have felt grace. Um, I think it's just much easier to give give to others. So I think in that sense, I, I think we have just probably failed um, in the church writ large and in into each each individual life to show grace to, to other people. I think the way you find grace and different people do it in different ways, but it is an intimacy in a, uh, with Christ and, and, and the affections of our heart are won over by um, by Christ that seems so obvious and yet I think it's so central and I think if that that doesn't happen um, then uh, 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 it gets harder because these emotions that one feels in life in politics and theology you care deeply about issues I mean that's part of the human condition and that's not necessarily bad I mean people should care about injustice they should speak out about it but it has to be infused by that sense of grace I mean I you know in American history I, I I say Martin Luther King, John Lewis, who just recently died, were were a wonderful model of that. I mean, they stood for for justice, yeah. and yet they and it wasn't just it wasn't an affectation. They they loved and they pre. This wasn't that they preached about love, but they but they really loved. So I think that's part of it, which is we really just in our individual lives have to once again be touched by grace, and part of that is through through those whom we know. Um, I'd say that the fear factor I mentioned earlier is is mm -hmm. I think. It's a really big deal. In my conversations with evangelical Christians, I am struck 
by um, the the feeling of of that this is the apocalypse that we're you know two minutes from midnight that all that we know and love may be lost in the next election or with the next Supreme Court nomination. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a kind of mindset. And as I said, when 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 you're in a, a mindset that's dominated by fear, it catalyzes a lot of other things. And so there, I think part of what we have to do is is to trust and to model trust in God. Um, and and that is the notion that you do the best you can, but that you but after that you really trust that that you know is God's is in control. The, the way I've described it, I think this is probably informed a lot by by Lewis, whom I mentioned earlier. But it is the feeling, and I've had this through my Christian journey. Um, I didn't grow up in a Christian home, but it's been very much a part of my life. Um, and it was the idea of of being part of a story with a beginning and a middle and an end. And even though in an individual life or the life of a country, you may be dealing with certain acts or certain chapters which are difficult and painful and maybe even searing and you can't quite make sense of it, um, that's okay and that's not unbiblical. But it is the notion that there's an author to the story um, and that there's a purpose to life and that in the end, this unwinds in a way that 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 has uh, has direction. And I think if if we imbibe that, if if we make it part of, if we internalize it, that allows us to hold both more lightly to the things of the world, and yet at the same time, probably be more involved in the issues of of um, of justice. So I I, I think that that's. Uh, that's part of it as uh, as 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 well, and then to surround ourselves with with community, um, with mm. with people um, yeah. who who model it. Um, and what you again, David, what, what what you said was very very important. You have to have people in your life, I think, who can speak, who are standing in your life, that can tell you if you're if you're um, if you jump the tracks, um, mm. and who can offer. Um, you know corrections to because we all have blind spots why yep. people aren't ones who don't have blind spots they're ones who have people in their life that point them out and then you make the adjustments as you go on uh man again pete the term i'm going to use is that's dope bro that's good that's real good that's real good hey here's my question for you um because uh, we we move in different spaces um, you know, as a president, I move in different spaces, and as you are out writing and having conversations, um, one of the things that, uh, and I'm visual, so Pete, this comes from a person who's very visual. In Acts 11, going back to Dave's question about grace, one of the things that the uh, writer, Dr. Luke, made sure we knew of, and he says, when Barnabas came down to this place that Dave described where there was this diversity of leadership, it said this, and he saw the grace of God. And so, um, Peter, in, in the world that you're operating in the movement, hey, I'd love to hear um, maybe some places you can point to where you actually see this grace lived out. Yeah, you know, there, uh, uh, politics is, is a place often where where you don't see uh, grace lived out, um, unfortunately, it doesn't it doesn't lend itself um, to it um, very often. Um, but we have to find it where where we uh, where we can. I, I must tell you, this is not quite politics per se, but when there was um, the um, the shooting several years ago in Charleston, South Carolina, where um, uh, where uh, Dylan Roof, who was a racist, killed a number of African Americans who were having a Bible study um, at uh, AME Church. Mm -hmm. um, it was that extraordinary moment, you may remember, where it was at the arraignment, and they brought in the family members of those who had died. And um, when they saw Dylan Roof, several of the people, including mothers, th through tears, said that they forgave him. And I sent mm. a of that moment uh, to a good friend of mine who's uh, who's an atheist um, and we've had a lot of conversations about faith and and he he wrote me back and he said you know I, I haven't understood what the concept of grace is and I still don't think I do but I understand it a lot better having witnessed that moment and 
the thing that I think Christianity has to offer to the world, which the world doesn't really have much access to beyond Christianity, is grace. Um, that that uh, you know the, the world can do a lot of things to 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 help people, but the idea of grace, forgiveness, reconciliation when you've been the object of 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 pain and of hurt and of attack, um, that is in my experience the one thing that that uh, most captures the attention of the world, even if it doesn't convert them. They say they have something that intrigues me or that I that I that I may want. There's one story I'll just tell you uh, from uh, when I was in the White House with 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 George W. Bush and Scott McClellan, who had worked with Bush in um, Texas, and he was a communications person and he was press secretary and 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 he was when Josh Bolton became chief of staff, he was asked to lead. And uh, Scott ended up writing a kind of tell-all book, critical of the president, critical of, of 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 his colleagues. It was one of the few ones that came out in the Bush years. And Dana Perino, who succeeded Scott, is a wonderful person. Um, she had been really um, hurt and upset by Scott's book, uh, and President Bush knew uh, that that was the case. And so he he called Dana in. He may have called in one or two other people with in the communication shop, I forgot. And he said, in, in essence, look, Dana, I understand you're very upset about what Scott did. Um, Scott may be going through a hard time right now and we need to show him grace. And I don't want anybody on the record or off the record to disparage him, just let it go. Mm. Mm. And I thought that that was just, a, you know, what you were talking about earlier, which is you have to model some of this stuff. Leaders have to model it because people on the top create an ethos or an ethic. Um, yeah. And that was a moment where I thought that's a that's a pretty good demonstration of of what it means. And it and it really was something if you talk to Dana, she remembers that moment. Uh, thank you. Thank yeah. you. So that's a wonderful story. As we kind of wind up, um, Pete, maybe a, another question. This diverges a little bit, but you've been a proponent, of course, and you've lived this out in your life of uh, people of faith getting involved in the political process. Um, and whatever else the political process is, it seems to be at least in part about how you uh, steward power. So I guess maybe the very simple question we can end with this, Pete, is how does a person of faith get into the political process, knowing that you're going to have to deal with power and not get corrupted by it um, as you are trying to be, you know, a, a credible witness um, to Jesus? Good question. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I um, I should say that in, in my entire experience in politics, um, I would say that the group that it, in any realm that is most uh, seduced by power um, are Christians. I think they're the most easily seduced by power. Chuck Colson told a wow. story um, that when he was in the Nixon White House, this was pre-conversion, um, that uh, they were the easiest to, to to win over. Basically, what they needed was a picture with the president, and that was it. And I think that that actually goes to deep longing for all the talk <laughs> Christians have, particularly evangelical Christians, of being, uh, you know, citizens of another world, um, and and uh, and that this world is not our home, and that we're aliens and sojourners. For all of that talk, there is a deep, deep longing to be accepted by the world, almost like a child with with their face pressed against a candy store or or a toy store, longing to get in, longing to be approved, um, you know, of can 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 I be paid attention to by people at, at Harvard and you know the elite newspapers and so forth and so on? So I think we just need to name that. I think we have to accept that that's part of of what's what's there. Um, how, how do you prevent it? You know, I I'd say one thing is again political leadership is important. It's the notion. I, I think the church has to do a lot better job at uh, at trying to cultivate certain sensibilities and dispositions. I didn't used to believe this. Um, you know, I didn't think that. I certainly don't think the church should get involved in politics per se, not partisan politics. I don't think it's that's its role. Yeah. But um, I, you know, the example that I use is um, 
you know, if you have parents of, of, of kids, preteens, um, and you uh, decide that you don't want to talk to them about sex, that doesn't mean that they won't have conversations about sex. They're just going to have it with their ears rather than... <laughs> oh, you are a parent, huh? Yeah, yeah, I know. And we've had the conversation. And um, in the same way, I think political and cultural sensibilities, you know, the church gets you for an hour, maybe Sunday school. If you're, you know, dedicated, you may have a Bible study once a week or once every other week. But a lot of people of the Christian faith then go home and they have this feedback loop where they're either watching Fox or MSNBC for 20 or 25 hours a day or talk radio and that's shaping their sensibilities. I think the church needs to be more intentional about mm. this how do you engage the culture? How do you engage in politics in a way that's faithful? How, how do you become an agent of justice while also knowing that Christianity is in some ways the antithesis of power and earthly power? I mean, the symbol of Christianity is the cross. That is not a, that's not a symbol of, it's not yeah. a soul. And um, so I think uh, part of it is, is, is for us to understand, you know, what the, what, what the faith is. I, I do think that sort of our Catholic brothers and sisters probably have a better generalized, generally speaking, better approach to politics. They seem to have maintained their independence. Um, that, that is, they speak out on, on issues of justice, but there isn't this kind of, I think, partisan mindset that captures them in the same way. I don't think they're viewed nearly as, as much as, as a pawn or a tool of particular you know, political parties. Um, and again, I think we need people to model it and you need people in your life to be able to say, you're getting too close to this, you know, to, mm -hmm. to, to, uh, to power. And it's um, and it's it, it's um, it's 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 hurting hurting the cause. But to go back to some of what we've already talked about, I think part of this is just having our hearts won over to Christ. Um, and if that's lost, um, if that connection is 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 broken, um, it gets very dangerous. And I'd say with Christians, part of the danger is when that connection is broken. Uh, you, you get involved. It's not simply that you have deep political passions um, that are unchecked by grace and notions of reconciliation, but then you sacralize your beliefs. You begin to take your own partisan temperament and disposition and beliefs, and you say, well, this is what God wants. And when you go from that, when you escalate and go, this is children of light, children of darkness, we're on the side of God, they're on the side of Satan. That God's kingdom depends on whether we win and that they lose. That's a prescription for hate, um, for uh, for antipathy, for uh, lack of understanding, and for dehumanization. So it's um, we we just need to we need to name it. We need to be honest about it, and then we just need to, we need to work through it. Pete, that is a uh, that is wonderful stuff. And as a a Jesuit Catholic boy on the phone here with you. Uh, in listening to you, I was uh, just thinking about how uh, Ignatius said that the great enemy of the soul is what he described as inordinate attachments. Yeah. Um, and I think you beautifully articulated um, that in, in a way that was uh, quite, quite wonderful. Well, Pete, thank you again for just this wonderful conversation. Um, yeah. I think like Cornelius, um, we look forward to talking with you more. I think, um, I, again, I'm reminded about uh, the, uh, the guys on the road to Emmaus and their hearts uh, were uh, warmed within them in, in listening to you today. So thank you for your gift and your grace and your ministry, uh, Pete, in terms of your, your voice and your articulation of many things that are important. And with that, Cornelius, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah. Hey, and yeah, Pete, I'll say this as you um, step off. Hey, man, you got a lot of great affirmation in the chat. You know, sometimes we can't see it, you know, thumbs up, applause, you know. It's like, un unfortunately, it's not social media, so you don't see all the little likes and the little hearts and the little things springing up. So thank you, sir. Good word, it's, good word, good word. Good it's word. been great to be with you. Thanks for your leadership uh, in the Leadership uh, Foundation. Oh, man, we're, hey, we're doing, yeah, that was good. Hey, Dave, that was good. I, you know, okay, man, look, hey, man, bro. I mean, like, yeah, and he was a dad, too, huh? That was real, too. Hey, you know, that sex talk, you, hey, you can have it or you don't. They're going to have it with somebody. Okay. So, yeah. um, hey, today, man, look, 
you know, we, uh, we get a chance to hear from a local leadership foundation. And this, this time, though, um, we'll get to, we're going to hear from Lexington Leadership Foundation, but uh, from Eric. And Eric's invited um, a couple of the gentlemen that he works with there in um, Lexington, Marcus Patrick and David Kozar. And they're going to actually talk not only a little bit about what's been going on in response to COVID, but also about the second pandemic that Dave has talked about this, this um, um, injustice and social inequity. So, uh, fellas, all right, I will, um, why don't you share a little bit about what's uh, kind of going on, what you've been doing down there in Lexington, up there. I'm sorry, I'm We appreciate it, and uh, certainly your hearts were warmed also by uh, Peter's comments and good insight. So. My job today is real simple. I'm going to make a couple of introductions to two people who lead in Lexington. Uh, just happens to be they're also associated and on the team of Lexington Leadership Foundation. So to my left is Marcus Patrick. He leads our Urban Impact Ministry to young people. Um, they had a tremendous response to COVID. Marcus and I have been friends for 25 years and in ministry together for 25 years, starting in wow. uh, Urban Impact. <laughs> in Knoxville. So um, an incredible leader in our city uh, who's also been uh, appointed recently to the Mayor's Commission on uh, Inequity. And, and, uh, Congratulations. Yeah. Congratulations, Marcus. Man, nice job. Hey, be careful. Don't get intoxicated with power. Just, you know, that's what Pete said. Yeah. And David Cozart, who uh, I believe uh, you all have met, several of you all have met, uh, from, he was formerly on the board of Lexington Leadership Foundation. He actually went out to lay five with uh, at least one time back in the board days, uh, has real passion and heart for fatherhood. He runs our fatherhood ministry. So um, what we thought we would do today is I'd kind of sit back and just let Marcus first convey what we've done in response to the COVID pandemic. And then we'll kind of switch gears and corn, feel free to facilitate it switch gears, let David talk a little bit about okay. uh, uh, what we're, how we're focusing our attention and leadership and networks around uh, racial injustice and Lexington. So, Marcus? Okay. Yeah, so as, um, as we all witnessed how the pandemic hit um, kind of around the country and around the world, um, we knew pretty quickly that it needed to, we needed to jump in pretty immediately. Um, as our families were going to be hit um, with with the burden of being able to or not being able to feed their families and uh, get back to work and all that kind of thing. So immediately uh, when school was canceled, uh, we jumped right into shifting our our model from programming to uh, feeding. Um, and so uh, we started that very first week of feeding. Um, meals to kids and families in our community, uh, not only surrounding our community center, but also around the city with our Amashi program, uh, make sure those families got fed as well. Um, and as the, the weeks went on, we, we recognized that the need increased uh, pretty significantly. Um, we started the first week serving about 75 uh, kids and families. Um, and then by the end of um, the summer, we were serving over 300 meals a week. Ooh. Uh, a, sorry, Ooh. 300 meals a day um, to kids and families. So um, throughout all of that, we were able to still re retain some relationship with kids and families and develop new relationships with these in our community. Uh, so that was a blessing. Uh, we were able to, to feed over 25,000 folks over the course of 20 weeks. Um, and so that was uh, a major lift that we couldn't have done it without a, a strong team that was willing to, to do what, what was necessary to, to take care of our kids and families. Um, also in the midst of that, um, we provided additional meals for families to get through the weekend. Um, we were able to receive funds from individuals and from organizations that also helped us to cover rent costs and utility bills. Um, for some of our families, so we were grateful for that opportunity to make sure that um, uh, that we could eliminate some of the need for some of our families. Um, and throughout the course of that, we saw some of our families even re-engage and give back 
They noticed what we were doing for, for them and they did not nice. want to, they did not want to just be recipients of that. Once they were made, able to get back on their feet, uh, they jumped in and they started providing either meals or supplies or a little bit of money uh, so that it can go back into the pot to serve someone else. So um, we saw a guy show up um, and it, it was pretty incredible to, to see that take place. Um, we, we obviously missed some of the more, some of the interaction that we had with kids and families that we were used yeah. to, but, um, but this was necessary for us to do. Um, and we're again grateful for that opportunity. Well, one of the things I'll just say about Marcus and his, and his leadership and his team, um, you know, they live out the three strategic functions of a local leadership foundation every day of their lives. But to be able to pivot in such, yeah. like yep. everybody on this call has, it's been a local leadership foundation. It actually took the three strategic functions almost to a new level. I mean, we partnerships were strengthened, uh, joint ventures created in the midst of this. And we, you know, Marcus and his team started out by running to Costco and getting stuff. And then all of a sudden, you know, they're, you know, funding caterers and restaurants to keep people working in that industry and providing, you know, some incredible meals uh, to kids. Uh, and the way they wove all that together, it was people of faith, people of goodwill, um, building capacity in others and felt and joint initiatives. So pretty significant work uh, they've done. And in the midst of, quite honestly, in the midst of, we may not have enough time today, of some real tragedy in our ministry with kids that have passed. And in Lexington, where youth violence in the midst of this uh, reality has been, uh, it's more than overwhelming. Um, yeah. So, and then, and then, Corn, if it's all right with you, I'd jump. I'd love to let David just jump in and talk a little bit about uh, what he's engaging in right now um, in the city. He and Marcus both around systemic and systematic racism. Go ahead, go ahead David. I'd love to hear. Yeah. So addressing this issue that has been in this country for four centuries. Uh, and as folks have recognized on this call and in this work, uh, we believe that the Lord has divinely orchestrated a time that in this trauma, that trauma is now being unearthed as has been mentioned earlier. So fortunately here, because really of the good leadership of Eric and the ethos of this leadership foundation's work, we actually began addressing a little bit of this internally. Uh, before the most recent well, um, and and so I don't like it was the last year in um, our staff meeting that around some time we were having some local tragedies and some state administrative things that lent itself to systemic racism and on the federal level references to countries where people like. That look like Marcus and Corn and I come from, and yep. women of color being marginalized and ostracized, and mm -hmm. I think mean, mm -hmm. some black rage in a staff retreat. Quite frankly, okay, uh, we said <laughs> we said we need to first start internally, so we started doing some things internally. Then comes 2020, uh, mm -hmm. and all things 2020, uh, and so we. We're also doing some things in our prayer ministry, uh, mm. bringing churches together. Uh, but what rose out of that again before the recent swell was racial reconciliation, right? Because the church has been doing saying, do what we say and not what we do. Uh, we reference, you know, the Acts 13, the John 17, that the body of Christ was not activating that. So we have a small group. Uh, sort of that Matthew 13, 33, leavening of the 60 pounds. So we've got seven white okay. ministers and seven white ministers and faith leaders uh, and seven black ministers and faith leaders that are coming together as that leavening and we're meeting and we're calling it towards trusted unity. And we recently augmented that to, to be called towards trusted unity with welcome discomfort. 
because we're talking about white silence and how uh, the black church has interpreted that. And we're talking about the conundrum that white people can be in when they feel like as Christians, what can I say that's right? Uh, we're talking about political climates. And so it's got to be towards trusted unity with that welcome discomfort. And we feel like out of those relationships, it is going to permeate throughout this community and beyond. And so, again, fortunately, the Lord orchestrated that before. Um, mm. Yes. That it's being recognized locally and internationally and worldwide. Uh, we also have on, uh, you mentioned the mayoral uh, commission on racial equity. Uh, that we're blessed to have representation on. Marcus is on economics and education. Uh, I have, I'm on a committee that's looking at law enforcement uh, and law enforcement justice and accountability. I think our role is to be persons of peace and represent Christ on those things, but also talk to the very real issues of the racial trauma that is drawing these uh, or that is causing these. Uh, internal scars in our young people. Uh, we're having a manifestation of some of those internal scars of, from systemic and systematic racism. In the last eight days, we've had, to, to us, this is large numbers given the, given, given the scope and scale of this city. In the last eight days, four young men on the precipice of adulthood, 17, 18 year olds, I don't think any have quite made it, have been murdered. Um, mm. So we mm. deal with this tension of um, I'm in the process, we're in the process of calling out the systems um, while simultaneously we have to be addressing the communities uh, that have been traumatized by the systems and that trauma and internalized rage that's coming out on one another. That's a very interesting tension for, mm. for us to, to be in. Mm. Uh, mm. And so that's our current reality uh, in our position. And so once we're addressing it, so that's, that's a summary. Man, look, man, great work. Great work. It's interesting, man. Absolutely. Who knew, man, who knew really, truth be told, the conversation that God wants to have facilitated on these town halls. I mean, you know, so Dave is talking about, you know, some Acts 13, but to get to Acts 13, it started in Acts 11. So they probably had similar conversations like y'all had a year ago. You know, you can't, you can't get to some Acts 13 without some staff meetings, addressing some stuff, you know, you know, chopping it up on bruh. No, for real, for real. And so, um, well, let me ask you this, gentlemen, and, and uh, how can we be praying for y'all in uh, the good work you've done in Lexington? Uh, I'll start. Um, David mentioned the, the tragedies that, um, that we've witnessed in the last nine days, um, and Eric mentioned how uh, 2020, that started with us kind of in our families in, in January, February, we lost more than just those four young men. Uh, David was just speaking on the last nine days. Right. Um, but we've we've lost many young men that we're we're connected with um, since January, February. Um, and and as you said, we're we're addressing the things um, in the in the system from the systematic level, um, but we're also um, trying to engage these families that are that are dealing with the trauma of gun violence um, and the young men that are caught up in neighborhood beefs and, and that kind of craziness. Uh, and so what does it look like to bring those young men into a space and, and, and talk it out and, and talk about the repercussions of, um, of those actions and talk about the families that are affected by it, talk about the neighborhoods that are affected by it. Um, you know, we, we know what it says in, in the word, you know, um, as it is in heaven. We want this neighborhood, Woodhill, to be as it is in heaven, Lexington as it is in heaven. Um, mm -hmm. And that can't happen until we address those things that are out of balance with, with what God would have for us. 
Um, so clarity in uh, yeah. and ordering of our steps um, as as we make moves to uh, engage with young people, engage with families, engage with law enforcement, uh, engage with government officials um, and, and justice. Um, we want peace to happen, but peace can't happen until justice happens. Um, yeah. So, so those are, you know, we're seeing that locally, but also regionally. Louisville is going through it right now. Um, yeah. The Breonna Taylor case, um, everybody wants the, the protest to end. Well, we do too, but we want justice for, um, for a lot of things. And so until those things happen, we, we have a lot more work to do. Amen. I would ask you to pray for for here and in other places uh, for fruition, uh, sustainability, that this solidarity that's being expressed by many in this season is not just seasonal, that the solidarity outlasts the, uh, the news cycle, uh, that the solidarity causes people to have to have uncomfortable and disruptive conversation. Uh, that solidarity causes people to read their Bible differently. Um, <laughs> and pray that it continues and that it's not just a flash in the pan. I mean, when Paul talks about the Lebanon and Galatians, right before that, he said, you, you started off running wet, you know, mm -hmm. with what hindered you? And so I, I pray that, that folks don't get hindered and that this, those that have moved from solidarity to silence, agencies, municipalities and mayors across the nation, some pastors, black and white, uh, I pray that, this, that, that it lasts and that it's not a flash in the pan. Man, you got it, man. Well, hey, Eric, Marcus, David, man, thank y'all. Um, one, to thank y'all for the work you, that you're doing with each other, you know, um, and as, as Peter said, man, we need models of grace, and I appreciate the work, how that's spilling over um, into the various places in the um, state of Kentucky, so, man, well, I appreciate y'all, man. Hey, keep up the good work, man. That's dope, man. Keep, yeah, man, that's hey, good work. Oh, all right. Hey, Jonathan, do we have a, kind of some of our announcements? I, I can't remember the word that we call them. I apologize. We do. We do. There we go. Yeah. Okay. yeah. <laughs> thank you, Corn. Yeah, we do. And thank you. Uh, thank you to, to Peter and and to Marcus and David and Eric for joining. Uh, just a couple updates uh, here. Uh, the blog posts on the website. If you want to go back and watch any of these town halls, uh, those are all on the website. Also, want to mention the save the date for the LF President Gathering on Wednesday, September twenty third. Um, and also uh, wanted to remind uh, everyone as members, uh, each local leadership foundation is members of uh, independent sector, the Upswell Conference uh, will be virtual on October 14th to 16th. It's really reasonable uh, for members uh, as far as cost, uh, great guests, uh, and you really get a lot out of it, make great connections. Uh, so wanted to mention that as well. We'll chat out the link to that upcoming speakers for town hall september 2nd we've got jeff bailey uh he's with open fields and a senior innovation fellow uh with ccic talking about kind of bridging divide divides uh, and some of the work that he has done there uh, so we'll continue that conversation um, and september 9th we've got tim dalrymple from uh, uh, christianity today he's the president and ceo uh, and that should be a great conversation as well uh, and each week we'll feature local leadership foundations uh, so that's it for closing updates. Okay, thank you, Jonathan. And, uh, you know, our leader for the global office in prayer, she had to step away, so I'm going to pinch hit for her. But I did want to make mention of um, the prayer um, every Friday. I believe it's noon Eastern Standard Time, Dave, is that correct? That's correct. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, we definitely, you know, for those of you that got a chance to hear, read last week, prayer is really interwoven into the fabric of this movement here. And not only are we um, challenged to pray for one another each day, but also every Friday, 
this time carved out. So we definitely want to invite you to join that team of intercessors as they undergird uh, what God wants to see happen here. So uh, here, let me um, pray. Um, uh, Lord, uh, I began by um, upholding your prayer, actually, in that prayer that we would be one. Um, Lord Jesus, as it came through um, Sam and Reed, Lord, the desire to make sure that we build relationships that bridge, that the incarnation really is about um, welcoming people to tables. It's really about um, going to places that are not like us. It's really about engaging in conversations, um, even as Peter said, even when we have debate, it's debate for truth, but not for victory. I ask that we would not be seduced as we operationalize the will of change by power, but we would really um, be extensions and expressions of grace. Lord, um, cover Peter in the work that he's doing in the places that he goes. Um, thank you for the great work in Lexington as they, again, they are trying to be examples of Acts 13, a diverse group of people that are deeply committed to you um, as it is in heaven in the state of Kentucky. Um, as David said, may we have the resolve to make um, to continue the sustained work, uh, Lord Jesus, that we would not grow silent, uh, we would not be hindered, and as the word says, we would not grow weary in doing good. Um, Keep us all as we go about our work today and ask all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Hey, thank y'all again for another great week. Um, it is again, I'm, I'm hopeful. I'm really hopeful today. So we'll talk to you later. See you next week.